Okay, it's 9.05. Do you want to get going? Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Well, welcome, everybody, and thank you so much for taking time out of your day today to spend some time and, and attend our first virtual town meeting. Uh, we have a lot to cover, so um, welcome. Thanks for coming, and let's get started. Thanks, Don. Hi, everyone. I'm Sue McCormick. And I know many of you through my work with the district over the past several years. And I'm happy to serve as the kind of the moderator for the meeting today to just keep things flowing. I also want to introduce Gabe, who is graciously helping out with the technical support for the meeting and to also help things run smoothly. So thank you, Gabe. And Gabe and I will be checking in with each other throughout the meeting. Uh, I want to tell you just a little bit about what we're planning for our time together this morning. The purpose of the meeting this morning is really to just share some information about the current context and the situation that the, the district finds itself in right now. And we're going to frame that up through a combination of sharing a couple of videos and also hearing for, from some people on the board who have been working on these issues. We're also going to talk a little bit about the process going forward for making some pretty consequential decisions that are facing the district. And then we'll have some time at the end for questions. And then we are going to break into some small groups and give everybody a chance to just talk through uh, what questions you have, what your hopes and concerns are, and also to come up with some key questions that you would like to have answered that we can share back with um, with the district leaders so that they can address some of those questions. We may not get to all the questions in this particular meeting, but I think they'll be get back in touch with you. Um, just a couple of considerations for this uh, virtual meeting and Gabe, maybe you could share the screen for just a minute. So one thing we just want to let you know is that uh, this meeting is being recorded. And so we just want you all to be aware of that. Um, we also are going to ask you all, I think everybody is doing that so far, uh, just to mute your microphone when you're not speaking so that we don't have background noise. I think a lot of people are getting expert at this, so um, that's already seems to be happening. We also just wanted to encourage you to use the chat to collect, if you have questions, to put them in the chat. And we want to encourage you not to use the chat for a conversation. That's just going to be a little too much for us to manage, but we can definitely field your questions from the chat. Um, and then for the part of the meeting where we're going to be in some small group conversations, just a few general agreements I can help. Just make sure in your small groups that you know, you're really listening carefully to all ideas and that everyone in the group gets a chance to speak. And also, if you, people are sharing personal stories in those small groups, we just want to make sure that those are confidential unless you have permission to share them. And the purpose of creating those agreements at the beginning is just because we want you to be able to have a very frank and productive conversation. And so those are some basic things that might help. And the other thing that I'll say is I know many of us are experiencing some connectivity issues. So if you're having some trouble, you can try turning off your video and sometimes that will help you at least be able to hear a little bit better. So I think I'll just pause there for a moment and see if anybody has any, anything they want to add or any comments just about the basic way we're going to conduct the meeting. Okay. Thanks, Gabe. So now we're going to, we just want to get a quick sense of who is with us. And uh, we have enough people here that we're not going to take the time to do introductions, but we actually have a couple of quick polls that we're going to invite you to take. And one is just going to find out what your connection is to the school, and one is going to find out where, what town you're from. So, Gabe, if you can share that polling option, we'll just invite you all to take this. And Gabe, if you could go ahead and just share those poll results with us. Okay. 
Gabe, if you want to unmute and, and let us know. The poll says it's in progress, but I'm not seeing any results from the poll. So I think out oh, towards the top, there might be a, a share button. Yeah, I'm not seeing it, it's strange. It says poll in progress. Attendees are now viewing questions and no, but there's no results coming in. Are people, people feel free to unmute. Are you all submitting your responses? Yes. I was able to submit. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We could always do a roll call, Sue, in the chat. Just have people enter <laughs> those answers in the chat. Yes, if, if uh, why don't we do that? So just in the chat, just put what town you're from and um, to everybody and also your connection with the school would be great. And maybe, Gabe, maybe you'll, have, you'll figure that out for us. In a yeah, I'm wondering if when, maybe when I end the poll, it'll let me show. Oh, yes, it. end the poll, go ahead. <clears throat> yes. Okay, thank Gabe, there we go. <laughs> Okay, so, thanks so much, Gabe. So most of the folks here um, are, well, about half the people are family members of students, and we have a bunch of community members, which is great, some school board members and some staff, and we don't have any students with us. And then we have folks from all of the towns. We have a good representation from Bristol and Lincoln, uh, not as many from Starksboro, but we do have folks from all five towns on the call. So that's great. Thanks so much, Gabe, for doing that. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> to continue on with this initial setting the stage, we kind of know who's in the room. I just want to turn it over to Patrick for a minute to just give us a little update on, on how things are going. How are the students doing? We didn't mention this at the beginning, but of course it goes without saying, we're just in a really unprecedented time right now between the pandemic and um, you know, just a lot of uncertainty and a lot of divisiveness in our political life, calls for racial justice. There's just a lot of uncertainty and a lot of really big issues percolating for all of us. And so we thought it would be good for Patrick to just give a very brief update about how schools are doing, how some of the students are faring during these unprecedented times. So Patrick, I'll turn it over to you. Sure, thank you. So this is now I think week six of being back in school since the September 8th start. And uh, probably as most folks know, we started all of our grades pre-K through 12 in a hybrid model. And that had its challenges. Uh, this is now week two of our elementary students being back in person five days a week with early release days on Wednesdays um, with an option for a virtual elementary school for those who choose that. Currently uh, there are 32 students enrolled in our virtual elementary school. Our hybrid, our, our hybrid model is still in place in the 712. Um, so those students are at school in person two days a week and remote three days a week. There's also an option for fully remote, and there are currently 63 students in that fully remote mode here at Mount Abe. The elementary return to full in person is going really well. People are adjusting to the, the new normal, right? I think uh, in conversations I've had with people, there's an appreciation for, um, for how normal it feels despite it being you know, far from normal, really. Uh, but the masks and the distancing and uh, all those practices and routines are feeling uh, pretty solid right now. Mount Abe is still working in a hybrid, which is really hard. It's hard for teachers to juggle, and this was true for the elementary as well. It's hard for teachers to juggle the in-person students, the hybrid students, and the all remote students. But teachers at Mount Abe are doing a great job. Uh, having these Wednesdays where there are no students in person is really important to give teachers time to stay on top of all three groups of students. So we, we definitely appreciate having that. Early on, there's definitely still an emphasis on the socially and emotionally healthy kids, uh, which actually is one of the community values that surfaced in the fall. Guidance counselors are checking in with students and staff um, are all really focused on supporting students' social and emotional health. We are really happy to have our elementary students back five days a week. Uh, we know how hard it was for families during our all remote and our hybrid models, juggling home life, work life, school life, and that really created some hardships for our families. 
uh, even though we offered childcare during that period, um, we know it still created some hardships. Having the elementary kids back five days a week is really critical in helping to ensure equity for our students, which is also a community value and part of our strategic plan. We know that during our all remote phase um, in the spring and, and then during the hybrid this fall as well, there's a tremendous inequity in the kinds of supports and experiences that students are having when we're in that remote mode. So having them back in person really helps address those inequities. Similar challenges exist at Mount Abe with, with a hybrid model. So some students are doing really well with a hybrid, like that flexibility with a schedule, some in person and a lot not in person works well for them. Um, but we also know it's a, it's a real challenge for some students as well. So we are con continuing to look for ways to bring students in the 712 back for more in-person instruction, but we need to be able to do it safely and confidently. And unfortunately, we haven't yet been able to find a way to do that while adhering to the guidance from the Department of Health and the um, Agency of Education. But we are gonna keep exploring those options and we'll keep monitoring the, the status of the pandemic in our area. And we'll continue to watch how the guidance evolves at the state level. We are very aware, um, and we talk about this from time to time at the leadership level, we are very aware that there's risk to bringing students back for more in-person instruction. And it's really important to know there's risk to not bringing students back for in-person instruction. And we're trying, trying really hard to navigate those risks and make decisions that are in the best interest of our students. And we're gonna continue to navigate those risks um, as this pandemic unfolds over the next several months. All in all, uh, we feel really good about the way we've been able to, to bring students back and kind of reopen this fall. We've done some evolving as that has happened, and we're going to continue to evolve throughout. So that's sort of the status of where we are now. Great. Thanks so much, Patrick. And now um, we're going to turn it over to Krista for a little bit to talk a little bit about um, some of the work that's been happening to engage with the community at the same time all of this stuff is unfolding around the pandemic. There's also some really important big picture questions and dilemmas the district is grappling with. And Chris is gonna talk a little bit about the work to keep the community engaged and informed as those conversations are happening about some of the long-term issues. So Krista. Thank you, Sue. And I hope everyone can hear me all right. I apologize that my video is being kind of wonky. So I would much rather be speaking to you more in person, but here we have it. Um, so I want to also say thank you to Patrick for that update and just recognizing what a unique and challenging start to the school year it's been. Um, so I think it's great to, to get a sense of how it's going. Um, and I'd like to also acknowledge and appreciate how hard all of our teachers and staff and administrators have been working to make this the best start to the school year as possible. Um, but as Sue said, I'd like to talk a little, I'd, I'd like to shift gears and talk about um, work that began before the pandemic. And um, for the past year and a half, the school board's been working really hard to inform our community about some of the more chronic, longer term challenges we've been grappling with. And one of the things that we've done is to develop a series of short videos. And I think they do a really nice job of framing this dilemma in a pretty clear and concise way. You may have already seen them, but I hope you don't mind if we play them again here. Um, this first video is just over two minutes long. So Gabe, if you can just play that for us, that would be great. I think that's the second one. If you can go to um, the slide before that. Yep, there you go. Thank you. And I think you can probably make it fill the screen there. Gabe, Gabe, I think you also you have to unmute yourself so we can hear. Hmm. Hang on, everyone. Thanks for your patience. 
maybe Gabe's thing has to. Gabe open has up. to unmute himself. There we go. And then if sixty-nine to me. Thank you. Sorry about that. That's okay. Always. Over 50 years ago, Bristol, Lincoln, Moncton, New Haven, and Starksboro came together to form the Addison Northeast Supervisory Union, a group of ANESU administrators, community, and board members had Mount Abraham Union Middle and High School built in 1969 to meet five town students' educational needs. Fast forward to 2016. All five towns vote to consolidate, and the Mount Abraham Unified School District is created. Like many school districts in Vermont, MAUSD is facing significant challenges, most of which predated the current COVID-19 pandemic. One, decreased state funding due to declining student enrollment. Two, improving student outcomes. Three, aging facilities. And four, ensuring all students have access to equitable academic experiences. The complex question we face in 2020 is this. How can we shape our future together and create a vision to improve our students' education in a sustainable and fiscally responsible way? To help begin gathering information to answer that question, MAUSD reached out to the five town communities and held seven community engagement meetings in the fall of 2019. Over 250 parents, community members, staff, students, administrators, and board members attended these meetings. Values, ideas, and essential questions expressed at these meetings have informed administrators and the board as we problem solve what configuration of programming, facilities, grades, and staffing will best serve our pre-K through 12 students in the future. As in the late 1960s, the five town schools are at a critical juncture. In the next of our series of three videos, we'll share more details about the challenges, including the MAUSD financial picture, enrollment trends, and information from the NESDEC Facilities Best Use Study. After we share this critical information, MAUSD will continue seeking community input via a survey in October. Thank you for watching. Please share with your friends and neighbors. Thanks for showing that, Kristen. Before Krista goes on to the second video, I thought I would just jump in for a minute and talk a little bit about some of the core values that we heard during those conversations. And I had the privilege of being at all of those conversations, and there were just some really strong um, things that came through from the community that were very aligned across all of the five towns. In fact, one of the most surprising things about that work was the incredible alignment across the five towns. And what people really cared about, of course, their students. We had lots of family members and educators in the room for those conversations. People, if you were there, you'll remember, there was a lot of conversation about making sure that your students um, are able to communicate, interact, be in meaningful relationship with others. There's lots of concerns about social media and technology and learning to navigate that well. And so this idea of having socially and emotionally healthy kids was really important. People also talked a lot about their desire for, you know, academic excellence, um, there's a lot of conversation about having varied opportunities for students, having programming that was flexible, flexible and able to meet the needs of a lot of different students and that students actually had the agency to really direct their own learning. So there's a real desire for flexibility and robust programming. And then there were also some other really strongly held values that came out as well around the um, desire for town schools and the feeling that being connected to the community was really important. People really loved the idea that students were known, that all students had at least one caring adult or more that was either a school presence or a community presence to help them navigate their way. So those were a couple of the things that we heard and that came through really strongly in those conversations. And with that little review, I'm going to turn it back over to Krista. Okay, thank you, Sue. And so um, in the second video, so we've, we've come out with two so far. We've got a third one that is in the works. Um, but in this second video, 
uh, we lay out some of the more specific information and talk about the process that we're using to determine which options have the most promise in terms of building a long-term sustainable facilities plan for our district. So I'd like to ask Gabe to play that video, which is about three and a half minutes long. Welcome to MAUSD Shorts number two, The Reality. In the last video, we shared current and future challenges facing the five town schools and how administrators, the board, staff, students, parents, and community members came together to identify education values and vision. In video number two, we'll present the data driving this conversation and details about how we'll continue to seek community input. In 2010, there were 1,662 students in the five town schools. By last year, that number had dropped by 18.5% to 1,354. Projections from the New England School Development Council predict another 15% drop in student enrollment by 2030. What makes this concerning is that any drop in student enrollment creates a deficit in the MAUSD budget. We are only allowed to spend up to the state per pupil spending threshold before paying a tax penalty. The state created this mechanism to control the cost of education. For each dollar spent above a given year's spending threshold, communities must send an extra dollar to the state. The MAUSD board has chosen to stay below that threshold to avoid paying this penalty. Because of fixed costs, such as salaries, health insurance, and building costs, we have to make up deficits with reductions to staff and or programming, deferring building maintenance or upgrades, or by raising taxes. Looking five years out, if we keep the same programming, staffing levels, and facilities we have today, projections indicate we would exceed that state spending threshold by as much as six and a half million dollars. What would that mean for our school tax rates? Using current assumptions and projections, if we make no changes, school tax rates for a home valued at $200,000 are projected to increase $1,598 by 2026. Due to projected enrollment declines, taxes become unsustainable even before 2026. A side note, the long-term fiscal projections presented in this video will not be affected by legislature's short-term relief actions due to COVID-19 for the 2022 budget. While schools will need less staff due to declining enrollment, if we are to cut the budget through personnel cuts alone, it would also cause a significant reduction in programming as well. This goes against our community's education values, which prioritize improved educational outcomes and options for students. In the NESDEC Best Use study of the six MAUSD schools, you can see each have faced. None are at capacity, and some can take in many more students than they currently have. The Facilities Feasibility Planning Committee has been working with the NESDEC study and input from the community engagement meetings to begin creating a menu of possible options. They are considering academic programming, operating, maintenance and renovation costs of each building, and looking at the advantages of keeping town schools open as they consider the most viable options for moving forward. MAUSD has shared this information to help the five town community understand that together, we need to make some significant decisions to help keep our school districts affordable, sustainable, and take care of students' academic needs into the future. Video number three will focus on future possibilities. We will be giving community members a chance to ask questions about this information and provide input through a virtual town hall on October 14th and 20th, and a survey at the end of October. You can find more in-depth data and information, including the NESDEC study, and how to sign up for one of our October town halls on our website, www.meusd.org forward slash CEC. Thank you for watching. Please share this video with other five town friends. Thanks, Gabe. Okay. Krista, I'm gonna hand it back over to you to- Yes. Um, thank you. So that's a brief overview of some of the information we're grappling with. And I'd like to introduce Kevin Hansen, who is the chair of the Facilities Feasibility Study Committee. And he's going to talk a little bit more in detail about both the NESDEC report and the work of his committee. So, um, I will turn it over to you, Kevin. Thank you. Um, again, my name's Kevin. I represent uh, Bristol on the on the board, and um, as as well as being on the uh, facilities uh, feasibility committee. The kind of a little bit of background about the NESDEC report. There's been 
uh, people that have looked at it to date have kind of questioned um, how inclusive it was, if you will, um, with various options that have been aired. So the, the report was commissioned to analyze current ca capacity of students and enrollment trends. And uh, the assessment looked at each of the schools and the current utilization as part of that assessment. And it went into a deeper dive, if you will, um, of projecting future enrollment based on um, what they were seeing for trends. And they also looked at a greater depth than has been looked at um, over the past few months um, through the engagement processes. They looked at birth rates, um, current in process, if you will, students from birth to pre-K. Uh, they looked at and they melded that with trends from the recent past to develop what is likely the projection um, going forward for not only the next five years, but they were looking out as far as 10 years as well as their crystal ball could allow them to see. Um, they, they also did um, an analysis of housing in the five towns, uh, what the construction rates been over the last 10 years, what zoning regulations are, how they're set up and what they would encourage or allow, if you will, um, to kind of like take, make an evaluation of where the housing um, market, if you will, would would support uh, um, any change in population over what they projected with the birth rates. They also looked at the real estate market to see how healthy the area is. And they, they melded this also with their experience in the region. They're a, a Massachusetts firm or based up uh, company and do a lot of work throughout New England and tempered that a little bit with national trends. So the, the report addressed the possible reutilization options based on these enrollment projections that they developed. Um, the pro report also looked at uh, the potential to partner with Addison Northwest or what's commonly known as the Virgin School District. Um, the report acknowledged six, all six school operations um, through their analysis of each school in the district, but they didn't um, verbalize an option to keep all six open um, as it, it was an assumed option for, from their point of view. Um, and that has caused some concern um, that maybe that option had been forgotten. But in reality, NESDEC didn't really have any offer, anything to offer. And really, it's within the expertise of the current administration through the superintendent and his staff to evaluate that option based on they're the ones that know what the knowns are and the history and likely melding with the projections. Um, overall for the district of where that that option can go. So that's kind of like where the report um, helped us go. Um, there wasn't a, a lot of uh, aha moments in the report. Um, there was better understanding of some of the assumptions that we um, had or were making. And um, it allowed us to basically continue the path of where we had been with um, our community engagement and administration cons considerations um, from last fall. Um, we know that we must have to make changes about how our operations are currently um, seen or op op you know, how the operations are. And really there's, there's, it's a twofold question or twofold issue. It's like, there's a one to three year period where if anything um, from a more intensive point of view was to happen would still be, there would be this one to three year short term uh, planning period. And then there would be, we're also looking at kind of a, a three to 10 year um, range where you would see longer range projections and um, what might need to be um, considered over that longer period of time and recognizing that the short term 
three, one to three years would be an implementation period for something that would happen longer range. Um, again, the NASDAQ report provided a deeper dive into demographics, enrollment, and facilities capacity um, that we had initially started um, within locally. Um, so that that was a good good thing to understand and under and realize that we were operating with, with within a reasonable realm, if you will. Um, some of the things that need to be considered, both from the board's point of view and the community's point of view, and their tough questions and and uh, the type of things that we're grappling with, is the board needs to understand how we're going to use schools. Um, as they are today or in some other educational use. Um, and through the superintendent, we need to understand what type of educational experience students will have, i.e. the programming aspects, if you will. Um, the board has taken the tack to date to stay within the state per pupil spending threshold. Um, as explained in the video, that can be a very expensive penalty should we go over if, if that is deemed necessary. Um, while they're presenting budgets to the district for voting. Some of the tough things for the towns to uh, grapple with is um, the, the ongoing need to provide um, a tax base or funding, if you will, through local, state, and federal taxes for that matter, um, as, as budgets escalate if they're not controlled. Um, they also need to assess any desire by the board to close an elementary school through a town vote in that town as the articles and agreements stand today. So we're kind of looking at different things and what the challenges is and what may inform um, the decision-making process for these challenges. Um, the superintendent and his team continue to evaluate options based on their expertise and and uh, which is really central to um, understanding what the issues are and work with the community engagement committee and the uh, facilities Fe feasibility committee to kind of augment and provide another perspective as they work those issues. The feasibility committee um, has been charged to provide pr perspective as advisors to the superintendent. So we, we are, giving an, a, a, a perspective, we're not making a conclusive recommendation. The committee's com comprised of school board members, there's two school board members, there's two community members, and the superintendent, assistant superintendent, and the business manager are also part of that team. The team was charged with, in the charge for the subcommittee, um, the group was charged with 18 essential questions. These questions were developed at the end of the day after a day long um, meeting at, that finalized the fall engagement um, activity, if you will, where um, community members, administrators, and the school board um, reviewed the scenarios that had been developed and were progressing towards, towards some consideration at that point. And these questions were developed at the end of the day. 13 of them, there's 18 altogether, 13 of them were, are really within the realm of the expertise of the superintendent and his administration. Um, they, they deal with hard, issue, hard issues like cost, you know, transportation, um, any, any sort of redistribution, those sort of things. There was two, two questions that really have been, um, and not maybe not um, consciously, but they have been worked by the or be, have worked or being worked by the communicate or community engagement committee, which has left three questions that are sort of soft, if you will. There's a lot of um, perspective uh, opinions to, to sift through um, through the work um, for the facilities communication or facilities community committee to deal with, and uh, we're working those. Um, three questions um, right now. So the facilities group um, has begun discussion of these three questions, which um, have to do with um, the impact of towns and students with school closings, um, 
whether um, the town or the towns um, would how the towns would fare if the high school was moved away, and then um, the in, in impact on um, community without without a town school. So those are primarily the three questions that the facilities committee is working on. We br briefly discussed those questions in October at our October meeting and um, didn't, didn't fully discuss them. We took them on as homework, if you will, to um, think about them a little bit more and put all the inputs, if you will, together and um, discuss the consolidated concept, a melded concept, if you will, or, or opinion, and pick the points or finalize that um, discussion through our November meeting. We also developed a uh, scenarios matrix that as, as we are dealing with a lot of different options and a lot of different considerations, it made sense to lay them out on a piece of paper and um, give a visual uh, understanding of what we're working with and, and trying to um, start understanding point by point the, the benefits and, and um, or liabilities of um, each option, if you will, across a, a variety of, um, of considerations. So the, the, the uh, matrix, um, as far as the options are concerned, were divided into three categories, essentially one category or one, one option bucket would be to continue operating all six campuses. Another option or bucket would be to reconfigurate the campuses within the district. And the third bucket is to partner with another district, namely Addison Northwest, as well as any sort of reconfiguration considerations. So the options were divided up into these three larger areas, and then they were evaluated, are being evaluated across a variety of parameters. And the parameters are, again, grouped into uh, programming or educational considerations, dollars or cost, or brick and mortar, or, ha or the impact of reconfigurating campuses. Um, a lot, all of the community core values that were developed last fall, there's 11 of them, are part of this chart. Um, the charge questions that the facilities committees grappling with a part of the chart, as well as a few additional um, items, particularly from a cost point of view, were made part of the chart. The, the assessment, um, the intent of the assessment is still fairly high level. Um, we're just ranking a positive, negative, or neutral aspect of each, each item on the chart. And again, we've started the discussion at our October meeting and given the limitation of time and, and length of the discussion, we um, have taken a certain amount of that work as homework and we'll be, be melding it or consolidating it for a, a more thorough discussion of a, of a total overview, if you will, at our November meeting. Ideally, we will be working to determine what is the best option of the options in each one of the categories, you know, that's operating six campuses, reconfigure campuses, or to partner. I think that um, pretty much summarizes some of the challenges to the district and where the feasibility committee is is working and and uh, hoping to come up with with some um, information to help the superintendent make his decision. So um, I think, uh, Krista, it's back to you. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Kevin. Um, so that is a lot of information to digest. And we're going to pause here. And I think Sue is going to help facilitate a Q&A. And I did want to say that, and thank you to Nancy for um, adding the link to the feasibility study committee charge, which also has the scenarios and essential questions. Um, I'm going to add a link to a document where I'm going to capture um, notes from these questions and, and uh, from the discussion in a little bit. 
Uh, but at the top of that, we'll include links to some of these supporting documents. So everything is in one place and will be shared out with all of you. And then if other resources come up that people want to have at their fingertips, we can add those as well. So um, I guess I will hand it over to Sue and I'll put that document in the chat now. Thank you, Krista. So we want to pause here and give you an opportunity to ask questions of um, Kevin or Krista or Patrick or anybody on the call. And just to help us navigate this, um, there's a participant button on the, if you're on a computer, it's on the lower part of your screen. If you're on an iPad, it might be on the left. But if you click on the participant button, there's a feature at the bottom that says raise hand. So if you um, click on that and raise your hand, that's one way that we'll know that you want to speak. Um, or you can just chime in. Also feel free to put a question in the chat box. And I'm also gonna encourage us to maybe turn on our videos if your technology will allow it for this part of the, of the meeting so we can kind of see each other while we're taking questions. And Gabe, you may need to tell me, I don't see any hands raised, but it may be that you're the one that's going to see those. So if you see any. Looks like uh, Cheryl has her okay. hand raised. Go ahead, Cheryl. Thank you. First, I just want to say thanks for providing us with so much information and these opportunities to give ideas and ask questions. It's deeply appreciated. I'm, I'm curious, I know that there are 23 other school districts in the state who are sort of up against this looming penalty deadline, and I'm curious about how we're working with them to either ask the legislature to slow down these penalties for a year, given all the changes with COVID, or if we might have some capacity to um, work together with those other 23 districts to say, we need some change, we need a little bit of relief this year because things are so different. Thanks, Cheryl. I can take a stab at, at responding to that. I think part of what I was inferring from that question, Cheryl, was sort of in the context of COVID-19 and, and all of that. And, and the legislature did act to hold districts harmless for their average daily membership, their ADM, which is a sort of a student number figure that's used in generating an equalized pupil number, which is really what we use to build budgets. So there has been some activity already at the legislative level to kind of offer a little bit of breathing room for FY22. Um, our understanding right now, though, is that that sort of hold harmless sunsets after FY22 and our numbers then sort of catch up to us, if you will, for FY23, right? So we're, we aren't gonna be penalized for a drop in students for FY22, but we are actually going to experience a drop in students in FY22. And then we'll see another drop in FY23. And in FY23, we'll have to build a budget that reflects the drop in both FY21, or sorry, FY22 and 23. So it, it does give us a temporary reprieve from what would otherwise have been a really hard budget year. Uh, but it catches up to us. And can I just um, add, are we working with also about getting the state to pick up the cost of health insurance so that that's not a burden on the school districts? There hasn't been any conversation that I've heard of about the state picking up the cost of health insurance. Um, the state now negotiates health insurance at the state level for all employees in school districts, uh, but there hasn't been any conversation that I'm aware of of that being picked up by the state. That's still a, a cost burden um, borne by the local school districts. Thanks. And, and part of your question I didn't really address is are we working together with the other 23 school districts? I know. We work really closely as a Champlain Valley group of superintendents, and I would say even more so the Addison County superintendents, in particular Addison Central, Addison Northwest, and us here at Mount Aid. Um, we're all in a really similar boat in terms of declining enrollments and the, the cost implications of that. Uh, I would say Addison Northwest is probably a year ahead of us in terms of 
the significance of their of the cost implications. And Addison Central is maybe a year behind us, but we're all we're all kind of working through the same kind of issues, and we do meet and and talk about those challenges. So in that way, I would say we are working together, um, and it's a it's a very similar struggle in each of our areas. Go ahead, Adrian. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering if you can um, articulate some of the criteria that would be used um, under options, uh, the two options that are in the feasibility study scenario 2A and 2B, um, like how you would, what are some of the criteria you would use to assess which elementary schools were the ones that remained open? Yeah, I'm not sure if that's directed to me or more to Kevin for the facilities group that's going to be weighing that. Well, it would be directed to whoever identified that scenario. From, from the facilities communication, or I'm sorry, the facilities committee's point of view, we're not going to recommend closing specific schools. We're going to recommend um, what makes sense for the um, reduction or consolidation. There's a lot of variables that go into that consolidation, if you will, that um, is much more refined um, detail than what our committee, the level our committee is operating at. It, if it, uh, there's a lot of variability about which schools close, um, and that could impact um you know renovation costs potentially so that information will ultimately be by the superintendent's recommendation when they his staff he and his staff get to the level of making some more finite um, recommendations after we kind of hone in on what makes sense from our group's point of view with all the options that are available we're basically trying to to screen the options and make it easier to um, give a point of view as to what's the most viable thing in the three categories that we're looking at. And Kevin, oh. just a, a further point of clarification before we go back to Adrian or Patrick and or Patrick. Kevin, you mentioned uh, there are three buckets you're looking at and one bucket is the current configuration. The second bucket is some kind of consolidation and then the third is a partnership in that second bucket how many scenarios are you currently looking at there's isn't are, are uh, those there's maybe four yeah. okay there's, there's the 2a and 2b that adrian referred to and then there are and, and then there's a nesdec option that in my mind it's listed but in my mind, it's it's essentially um, it's virtually similar to I think option two, and I, then I think there's two more Nasdaq options. So that's five options okay. within that bucket. Okay, I just thought that would be helpful for people to have that context. Go ahead, Adrian. Yeah, so I was just going to say, so is it accurate to say that the um, superintendent's office has not yet developed the criteria because they are awaiting the facilities report? as one of the input, um, inputs? Yeah, I think we're definitely still in the process of collecting information and thoughts from folks. If I, if I think about, and, and there are many nuances to it, but the big, I think the big considerations would be the capacity of the building, the needs of the building, and the impact if, if a town didn't have that school, what would the impact on the town be? Because if the impact is perhaps different town to town, uh, but those are three of the significant uh, considerations, I think. And then there are many, many nuances beyond that. Any other questions? Well, let's take a pause. Go ahead, Cheryl. You do have another one. You have to unmute yourself. I'm sorry. Thank you for letting me ask another question. Sure. I don't see anywhere that we had done an asset map of 
um, potential other users of the buildings for necessary, like who's available in the community that might want to run child care or after school care or put in healthcare services in that unused, um, whatever we're calling the excess capacity of those buildings. And I'm wondering if that might be a helpful thing, or maybe, maybe it's been done and I just was not looking in the right place to find it. That, that um, thought comes up a lot in discussion. Um, that the level that the facilities committee is working at, we're not looking at, um, we're looking more at utilization of buildings, not re repurposing, I guess you could say. So it's not germane to the committee, um, but you know, maybe Patrick can talk a little bit more about the um, discussions to date, because that, that whole concept has come up through a variety of meetings. Thanks. Yeah, and that conversation, as Kevin said, has come up a few times over, and we've, we've looked at that, and I think there are some possibilities there, and there's some potential for some revenue and some creative use of space. In terms of leaning on that, that kind of use of our space and that revenue, it's insignificant relative to the, the kinds of financial pressures that we're under in terms of the, the money it would generate. So we, I forget exactly what the cost per square foot was that we we discovered through a little research about what what's kind of the going rate for leasing out space but we we would have to lease out something like 150 classrooms to generate sufficient revenue to sort of make a dent in our financial challenges and obviously we don't, I don't think we even have 150 classrooms total in the district so when we looked at it from that perspective so there's some possibilities there that I think may warrant exploration, depending on how the sort of master plan uh, ends up moving forward. It's insufficient to meet the financial needs that, that we expect. Go ahead, Sally. Could I? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I was just going to chime in if I could from the community engagement perspective, because I, I think that this is a great place where the board in our focus and the administration in their focus don't have the capacity to to dive into uh, really fully exploring asset mapping but that is I think critical to any vibrant community and um, could be woven in to options if uh, school building were um, vacant or even if we're to it be open but at minimal capacity um it's just that it's difficult for the administration to focus on really diving deep into that work while also um you know trying to get a handle on on um cl you know clear and information that can help us right now and so i would just invite you know we had a, a gathering of community and school folks in the summer to begin those conversations. And I think I would just say that um, it would be great to have folks thinking about those things and putting time in to really do that work and then share that with us. You know, that that is, we're always, I think, open to that. It's just that we also have a timeline by which decisions need to be made based on the information we have right now. That's the piece I wanted to speak to for just a minute is the timeline, because I think that's important. We talked a little bit ago about the sort of one year breathing room that we seem to have now, thanks to the legislative action to hold harmless for a drop in our average daily membership. Um, but from a timeline perspective, I just want to make sure it's understood that short of the board deciding to repurpose the school building, which could happen next year, although it's, um, any decision, like any really big decision that we're talking about in terms of finding cost savings, um, in, in particular through facilities, we wouldn't realize the financial benefits of any of those decisions until FY23 at the earliest. So even though FY22, we have a bit of a reprieve, 
we're not making really FY22 decisions now when we talk facilities, we're making FY23 decisions. And that again is the year when the FY22 impact and the FY23 impact of our declining enrollment will be felt together in that one year because the hold harmless will sunset. I just think that's an important piece. Uh, Patrick, thank you for that. I want to go back to something that uh, the exchange between Cheryl and Krista about the asset mapping. And I just want to put a reminder out there um, for the people on the Community Engagement Committee, and it, uh, I think hopefully it will be useful. When we first planned the community conversations in each of the five towns, we had planned on part of those conversations being a conversation about what are the possibilities for the school building in your town if for some reason it didn't, it wasn't able to continue on as a school. We thought it would be really helpful to start having a proactive conversation about that and about some of the possibilities around that. And in the very first town we went to, what we found was that people were not ready to have that conversation. And we changed our plan and we didn't even ask the question in the other towns. We were really trying to honor where people were and people just were not there. What I would say is that um, I think there's a lot of opportunity to do some really innovative things from a town perspective. And there are lots of resources in the state. The Vermont Council on Rural Development is an example of organizations that can come in and help a community create a vision for a building and identify resources to help transform it into something new. And so I just wanted to say that even though we didn't, um, the school district didn't <clears throat> go forward with that part of the conversation, I do think that that's a really important proactive conversation for people to be having. Sally, you've had your hand up for a while, go ahead. Um, yes, thanks. Um, this is a great uh, conversation. I'm, I'm enjoying it. Um, so my question was, how is the board or the superintendent or anyone exploring what it means, what's the impact for schools if they are lost in a small town? And I think there are studies that are out there, but also how about these specific schools? How would, how would you go about exploring the impacts of that with each uh, community is one. Another is, um, the, I appreciated hearing from Sue about the, those studies. And is there a way to work with towns to find a hybrid way of having some school there and also using the school for various um very useful things that this uh, town could could use is there any study that's kind of thinking about a hybrid like that patrick to you i think patrick you started to address that earlier around some of the what you had looked into around potential partnerships yeah, I can I can share a little bit about some of the conversations I've had and, and maybe Kevin can talk a little bit. I know there's been some studies presented through the facilities group as well. Um, so I've I've actually reached out to some to a superintendent um, who was involved in some school closure in their district in some small towns and just trying to understand from a really local perspective what has the impact been and um, how that was how they navigated that and <clears throat> through that conversation and I think through just further thinking and 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 understanding about about kind of the direction we're going the reality is the impact of closing a school in a small town is different town by town and I think it's it's readily recognized that a school in a town is part of that town's fabric and in many cases it's not the only part of that town's fabric so i think as we consider the possibility of closing a school in a town we have to try and understand the more um, sort of full picture of what what makes up that town's fabric when i think about the role of general stores and town halls and um, athletics like there are a lot of different things you can look to that you could say make up the fabric of a town and you have to think about um, the role the school plays there and in the absence of that 
what's the likelihood or possibility of those other aspects of a town in sort of picking up what would be lost um, if the school wasn't there. So that kind of thinking and, and sort of analysis on a town by town basis, school by school basis, seems important. When we look at national studies of closing small schools, from the national level, small schools are schools under, like elementary schools under 600 kids, high schools under 1,000 kids. We don't have small schools in Vermont, we have micro schools in Vermont. And I'm not familiar with a study that talks about the closure of micro schools and its impact. Um, and I think that's been some of the struggles that have, have come through the conversations at the facilities committee as well. So it's, it's not exactly apples to apples. So for me, it's more helpful to think about it on a town by town, school by school basis, and from that sort of fabric of the community kind of lens. And I just want to ask, how would we go about doing that on the local level to do that exploration of the fabric and what that impact would be? It's a good question. The only thing that comes to mind for me is, is having conversations with folks that are knowledgeable about different aspects of the town and what, what helps to create that fabric. I think about the role of local town leaders and their knowledge of the town and, and what happens there. You know, not necessarily every resident of a town has a full understanding of, of what happens in that town and what makes up its fabric. Um, but I would say most local leaders would have that information. I, I, would, I would just add that um, we had um, discussion about this very issue about reports and, and um, what what uh, as Patrick mentioned, what a small school really is at the last full board meeting when we talked about the facilities work, um, and we we um, as a committee are looking more. Um, they're soft questions. We're looking at soft perspectives from uh, you know it's a relatively small group, but we're looking more and more along. Um, you know the the perspectives of the individuals um we do have we have had some report information uh, provided to us but um you need to be cautious about reports because they, they can be biased and and try to lead you a certain way as as far as what the towns feel of value and and how they might have some concept of repurposing um the community engagement committee spent a great deal of time um, kicking off some town school partnership um, activities or initiatives and that's really where that and it seems like that's where that conversation really should be going and and the other the other thing and and i don't want to start a big discussion here but the other thing um, we need to really keep in mind is our schools are operating to um, to op to um, uh, educate and form, you know, students. And you know, sometimes I'm not so sure that we don't um, take that as a as an assumed function. Um, and we need to make sure that that's in the highlight or forefront of whatever our decisions are. Robin, you want to go ahead? Hi, it's my husband, Jerry. Yeah, hi. I don't know if you can see me. Um, so one of, you know, we're talking about repurposing and, and centralizing, so to speak, or partnerships. So I wonder if there's been any thought about uh, perhaps uh, some sort of decentralizing of the Hannaford Center. And I don't know how that would affect any fiscal things. For instance, if some program that's now at the Hannaford Center was brought back, say, to Mount Aid, um, so that it's more accessible to students and there's less transportation costs. Or you could expand on that and imagine um, expanding vocational opportunities local in, within our local schools or within Mount Aid. Um, and attracting other students from elsewhere, perhaps even. But you know, the first thing would be the idea of, of decentralizing and bringing back 
um, some aspect of the Hannaford programs into Mount Abe. Um, you know, and then there's variations. Can I speak to that just briefly? Um, this is Allison Sturdivant. I was on the Hannaford board. Go ahead, Allison. We can hear you. Thanks, Thanks Susan. So, um, decentralizing the majority of the programs would be very, I would say, cost prohibitive because we serve Middlebury, um, Mount Abe, and Virgins as well. Unfortunately, yeah, so, Allison. Oh, there she goes. Allison, we weren't able to hear some of what you just said. Oh, so, okay, sorry. try again. Sure. So, um, I, it would be probably very cost prohibitive to decentralize the Hannaford Center because we serve Middlebury, Virgins, and then the Mount Abe School District. And we also have students that come from Otter Valley and some other places. So if you decentralize and move a program, um, say to Mount Abe specifically, then you also get into questions of equity of access. Um, having the Hannaford Center in Middlebury makes it more central to students to be able to access, especially uh, students coming from Otter Valley. Um, and if you decentralize, you might have to have more instructors at different sites because um, some programs aren't able to be done in certain places. So it, it might be an idea to evaluate, but I think it would be very cost prohibitive to do. Just my two cents, having been on the board and seeing what it does. And I would echo most of what Allison said. Um, you know, if we look at the the auto tech program at the Career Center as you know, sort of an extreme example, to to have Middlebury and Virgins and Mount Abe each have their own garage and tools and and staffing to run a program like that, with what would be you know a very low enrollment. You know, if we assumed the enrollment stayed similar to what it is now. That, that would work against the, the sort of cost savings um, that we need to find and the, the efficiencies ultimately that we need to find to be able to maintain programming. Now that's a, an extreme example. There may be some other examples that uh, you know, wouldn't have such overhead in terms of the space and equipment and everything. Um, but I think the same idea of um, the lack of efficiency in, in, in those programmings, I think would still be realized. You know, those classes right now are, are relatively low in terms of the number of students there. Allison may know more than I, but uh, my daughter actually attends the Career Center and the, the number of students in a class might be at 12 or 15 when you combine the districts. If we try to replicate that in each of the three school districts, I suspect the enrollment would be considerably lower, which decreases the efficiency. We can offer that. Thank you, Patrick. So uh, what I'd like to do now is thank you for all the thoughtful questions. We, there's a lot of people that have had a chance to speak and also a lot of people who are just listening and we want to give everybody on this call a chance to speak with each other. So we're going to break you out into some groups for about 10 minutes and Gabe, I'm thinking maybe we could do about nine groups with about four people in each group. And in your group, we just want to invite you to just reflect on what you've heard so far. Um, you know, share a little bit about how you're feeling about, you know, the information you heard, what the communities are facing, and then uh, we invite you to talk about any hopes you have for moving forward. And then if there's a key question that you would like to have answered as a group, we'd like to hear that as well. So Gabe, I'm going to invite you to, to create those rooms and uh, when they when it's time to end it can be a little abrupt, but you'll get about a minute minute warning and um, While you're talking uh, When you come back we have a notes document and Krista shared the link a while back in the chat But if you have any comments you want to leave in that Google Doc That's fine or you can also leave comments right in the chat based on your conversations And is it possible to share those questions on the slideshow so people can remember them? when they, um, Gabe, if you want to share your screen to that slide that just shows the three questions you just yes. articulated. Thank you. Nope. So, right, those breakout rooms. Yeah.
So those are the questions. We can also put those in the chat as well. And I actually, I can, we can broadcast them as well in the, in the room. Great. So, um, great. Okay, Gabe, so if you can work your magic and we'll, we'll have about 10 minutes or so to talk together and then we'll come back and hear some of your questions. Welcome back, everybody. I know that can be a little abrupt. So I think our group has gotten a little smaller. We th I know we uh, scheduled this meeting to go to 11, but we're going to try to end in the next 10 or 15 minutes. And what we'd like to do is I just want to invite a couple people and hopefully people we haven't heard from yet this morning to share a highlight or a key question that your group talked about. Go ahead, Rebecca. Hi, so I was um, in a group with two other people. And I think a question coming from it is that although we realize we have to address the monetary issues, it seems like what's not actively being pursued is the pushback up to the governor and the legislature about how they are going to address the economic issues that are basically causing this problem in the first place because school boards long term cannot solve the issue of younger families leaving Vermont and not staying. And I think dismantling our communities on any level um, seems to be going in a direction that would suggest that we're not interested in that in the long term. So that was our concern is that regardless of how we have to address it, what are we doing to strongly push back that this is not how we want to see Vermont grow? Thank you, Rebecca. Anyone else? I also, while we're waiting to see if someone else would like to speak, I just want to invite you to type your questions into the chat if your group came up with a key question that you would like to hear more about going forward. You can just type those right in the chat and those will be captured. I guess I have a process question. So there was three questions that we discussed in, in the breakouts. Are we, what, what do we do with our results of those three questions? So you can, there's a couple of things you can do, Kevin. You can put some of the highlights in the chat box. Also, Krista shared a link to a Google doc that she's been using to capture uh, input and that's another place if that's a little easier than writing in the chat you can scroll down to the bottom of that document and put in the highlights from your conversation so it's a little quiet I think what I'll do is um, turn it over to Krista now to talk about a couple of next steps unless there's anybody who hasn't had a chance to speak especially as a uh, something they want to share about your conversation. Yes, Coco. Hi there. Good morning, everyone. I would just like to return to that question that was just posed and, and find out a little bit more information about what sort of pushback is happening at the state level to um, figure out ways to support communities and small community schools because, you know, I, I hate to lean on the old saying, penny wise, pound foolish, but you know, if we close these small schools and consolidate um, districts, are we going to see continued increasing enrollment as families, you know, decide that it's not, that the benefits of living in small rural communities are, are too challenging? You know, I live in Lincoln. It's, it's a hard place to, to live in lots of ways. You know, it's, it's the long, commute to jobs in Burlington and, and some of the real benefits to living in these small communities are the small schools. And so if we see those closing, are we also going to then see more families leaving the communities and, and resulting in, in other um, challenges and in, in budget shortfalls? Thank you. Sure. I guess what, what I wonder in hearing that question is, well, maybe Patrick, you could just respond and, and let people
people know it, what kind of efforts, if any, are you or or education organizations in Vermont making around these issues? And then I also have a question for the community, which is, are there any uh, community-led efforts to be working with the legislature around some of these? So, Patrick. Yeah, I can I can offer my sort of assessment of the situation relative to the, the concept of pushback. So. From my view, push back to the legislature or the governor or, or some of the sort of higher authorities could be effective if we thought that the conversations we're having and the hard decisions we need to make weren't intended and known to be happening. Right? I think when when the legislature made the decision to have to have school budgets built based on a cost per pupil figure and they put a spending threshold on that. I think it was intentional to control spending. I think it was known that that's going to have an impact on the ability of small schools to continue to function. And I think it was going to, it was known that it would create the kinds of conversations that we're having now and difficult decisions. Um, and I think it, it stems from a desire to make Vermont more affordable, which is believed to be a strategy to help bring or keep younger people in Vermont. Um, with my thinking on that and my belief that that was intended, for me, the, the notion of pushback, right, for me to spend my energies pushing back against what I think was intentional and known to have the effect that it's having, seems like it doesn't, it won't produce the results that I'm looking for. And I'd rather spend my time figuring out how to make what we have to work with work the best way that it can, can work. Now that's not to say that there couldn't be something changed and that a community group or the board forming some sort of letter couldn't push on that. Um, but that's just sort of where I come from with my thinking on this situation. Thanks, Patrick. Is there anyone else that wants to speak to that? I, I it's like Rob has. Some... Go ahead, Kate. No, sorry, go ahead. Well, I, I can just speak to some of the other statewide efforts that might impact on this. And obviously, one of the most significant is the continued push to say, health insurance should not be a responsibility of employers. We've just seen it with COVID that as people lose their jobs, they lose their health insurance just at a time when they shouldn't. And the, certainly the health insurance costs have been driving school budgets for um, many, many, many years. So there's, I would say, a concerted effort to say we should have health care for all somehow and take that burden away from employers. So that's going on. There's also a um, an effort, and I don't know that it's going to move that fast, but it's not just schools that are being underused, but we have churches closing, Grange Halls closing. There are a lot of town buildings that are closing, and people are saying, could there be a way that some of these facilities could be picked up by something like the land trust and then made available back for school uses or child care programs or others? So I, those discussions also are underway and that would sort of scoop out some of the facility burden. Still the staffing costs are the hugest costs for us, the, the drivers and um, our small group was talking about if, if we're focusing on programming for students, are there ways that we could redeploy the incredible expertise that we have in um, Less, less costly and more effective ways so that all of our students are, are having pathways that work for them particularly. Thanks, Cheryl. Others? Krista, I don't know if you saw it from Kim. She was asking for the link to the group that um, is maybe looking at some of these issues? Oh, yes, I just saw that. Okay, I was typing. So I'm going to put that link in the notes document that everybody's got. Um, but I'm glad you suggested that, Kim, because you know some of these conversations were started and some of them um, did 
did continue outside of that school community forum. But that's a great reminder for everybody. Um, just give me a second to pull that up. And just as a reminder to people, the, the Community Engagement Committee did convene a meeting of interested town leaders uh, to encourage them to organize around some of these issues that we heard from the community that mattered. And I think that was one of them. And so there is some uh, other work happening that's not directly related to the, the work of the school district that is addressing some of these issues, I think. So Crystal will share that link. I think that we um, should probably start to close out. We've been together for quite a while. Um, and what I'd like to do is uh, just see if there's anybody else who has just a burning question or comment they want to make. And then I'm going to turn it over to Krista to just briefly share a few next steps before we close. Susan, I had one question if I, if I could go. Sure. Um, so one question I had is, um, so this is the start of my fifth fall here at, at Mount Abraham. And I know um, each year since I've been here, we've had um, at least what I would consider pretty significant uh, surpluses at the end of the year um, rain, with a pretty wide range. Um, I don't know the exact numbers, but a question that I've always had is, um, is there any consistency in the reason for the surpluses? I, I believe that uh, this past year obviously was totally unprecedented with COVID, but is there any consistency in what has led to um, those surpluses and the capital reserve fund that's been, um, I'm, I'm still not exactly sure how that works, but um, how the capital reserve fund has been, um, we've, I think, been putting money to that or into that. Again, I'm not sure how that account works, but I guess what I'm asking is, is there consistency in an area that we've been underspending for the past five years and, and have we identified those areas as a as a way that we could reduce um, funding as like a a short-term fix to alleviate some of the current stresses we're going to be dealing with over the next couple of years yeah i can speak to that and and that's basically that's exactly what's happening so there the reality is there are thousands of lines in the school district's budget and we build budgets with you know, long before the need comes and a lot of things can change between the time a budget's built and passed and the school year starts that it was intended for. And that makes up for a good portion of what our, our fund balance might be at the end of the year. But I would say the driving factor and, and one thing that is consistent and it's done intentionally in, and it's an attempt to help us alleviate these, these financial challenges in the easiest way possible is we have, with maybe a, one exception, we have elected to not fill anywhere from six to seven or eight positions each year after the budget's been approved. You know, people leave for various reasons, uh, knowing that we have these difficult financial futures ahead of us. We look at every position that becomes vacant and whether or not it needs to be filled. So when we budget for a position, someone chooses to leave that position and then we don't fill it because we know we're going to have to make budget cuts. And if we don't fill a position, it's a lot easier than having to fire someone from a position they hold. That creates, uh, uh, that adds to the fund balance that we have at the end of the year. I'd say that's the, the driving force behind that. The average total compensation for a staff member right now is about $80,000 for a licensed staff member. So for every one of those positions, it's 80 grand that we're not spending that we budgeted for. And so it doesn't take too many of those to drive a pretty significant fund balance. And then the thousand other lines that add up make up the difference. Thanks, Patrick. I think Rob and Robin at one point had their hands up and we didn't see them. Do, you, do either of you have something you'd like to say? Uh, yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, okay. Rob. So, I mean, this is Jerry Urban. So, oh, um, okay. you know, something to notice in, you know, listening to the, to the interest in pushing back again, you know, to change, affect changes in legislation and around funding. Something to notice is what happened with the 
community, I think they're the state colleges, Johnson and Linden, they're called Northern something now. You know, they were going to be closed. There's a lot of pushback. They're open. Now the problems are still out there. Um, so one thing is to notice the effect of the pushback. And two is to notice that in some ways we're in the same boat as they are. And it just kind of expands the base of why leg legislatures should be concerned about uh, local opportunities for education. Thanks. And Rob? No, all good, thank you. You're good, you're good, okay, all right. So Krista, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I know you had a couple of next steps that you wanted to share with everyone before we close. Sure, so, um, so I think everybody hopefully has access to the notes document and we will add anything from the chat to that and post um, to the Community Engagement Committee webpage. Um, this, these discussion questions and responses and the feedback from the next town hall are all going to be shared with the full school board and the administration. Um, and just to let people know about what's next in the process. Um, so we're also, as was mentioned, going to be sending out a survey at the end of October that will go to all five town residents. And the goal of that survey is to gauge the community's interest in exploring several different options, as we mentioned before, um, some of these different buckets of ways to think about our school facilities plan. So the responses from that survey, the recommendations from the feasibility study committee, and the feedback from these virtual town halls are all going to be part of what the administration takes into consideration when figuring out uh, what to present to the school board in December. So the school board, board will receive their recommendation of three to four options, and then those will include um, really specific information like budget and tax implications. Um, some of the details that people have been asking for, that will be all a part of that presentation. And the board is then going to take that back out to the community for additional feedback before deciding what, if anything, to put on the ballot on town meeting day. So we're working backward from that March date to figure out uh, what we might want to warn for that ballot, which has to happen in mid-January in order to get on a ballot. So we, the school board's really committed to working hard to continue providing opportunities for your input and for as much information as possible before we ask you to vote on anything. And it's important to remember that no decisions can happen without your vote. So uh, in closing, I'd just like to thank you for coming and being with us today, um, to please keep an eye out for the survey, to encourage you to attend any of the meetings of the full board, of the Community Engagement Committee, of the Facilities Feasibility Committee. It, it can be really helpful to just listen in on the conversations that are happening and the ways that those groups are really thinking about this. And the dates and times of those are on the MAUSD website. Um, and I see Sally was asking about the recording of this town hall. So this recording will also be posted as well as the recording from next week's town hall. So, and before we end, I just want to also thank Gabe, who I think um, in all of his great efforts, he froze his computer. <laughs> so I don't think he's on the call any longer, but he did a great job up to that point helping us navigate Zoom. And I also want to give a very special thank you to Sue McCormick, who has been partnering with us for a while now, really helping to guide us in the best way to engage and incorporate your input into the decisions we make about the future of our schools. So thank you all, and um, you'll be hearing more from us soon. And I think, Patrick, you're the host, so you can probably end the meeting. So I hope everybody has a great rest of the day. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Thank great you. Meeting.